This story begins in 1991 with this gentleman, Trevor Bayliss. He was an amateur inventor and in 1991 began to work on a project which was to have widespread impact despite or perhaps because of being a low technology solution to a huge problem. Trevor had seen a documentary about AIDS in Africa and began to see an underlying need for something to help communication. Much of the AIDS problem lies in the lack of awareness and knowledge across what are often isolated rural communities. People simply don't know about causes or prevention of this devastating disease. And that's part of a bigger problem about communication. Experts reckon that fewer than 20% of the world's population have access to a telephone, and even fewer have a regular supply of electricity, much less television or internet access. And very low literacy levels mean that many people are excluded from reading newspapers or other print media. So radio is an obvious solution to this problem. But how can you make radio work when receivers need power, and in many places, as we've just said, electricity is non-existent? Well, one alternative is battery power, but batteries are also problematic. Even if they were of good quality and freely available in the village store, people couldn't afford to buy them regularly. So what was needed was a radio which ran on some different source of electricity. And in thinking about this problem, Trevor Bayliss remembered the old-fashioned telephones of the pre-war days, which used to have wind-up handles to, ex to generate power. He began experimenting linking all sorts of odd things together, like a, an electric motor, a little hand brace, and a small radio. And he found that by turning the motor with the brace, it could act as a generator that supplied enough power for the radio. Now, the first working prototype only ran for 14 minutes after a two-minute wind, but Trevor had invented a clockwork, a wind-up radio. Although this was an interesting idea, like thousands of entrepreneurs before him, Trevor had trouble convincing other people of this. He spent nearly four years approaching major radio manufacturers, people like Philips and Marconi, but to no avail. But luck often plays a significant part in innovation, and this was no exception. The idea came to the attention of some television researchers, and the product was featured in 1994 on a BBC programme called Tomorrow's World, which showcased interesting and exciting new inventions. Now, amongst those who saw it and whose interest was taken by this wind-up radio idea was a corporate finance expert, Christopher Staines, and a South African entrepreneur, Rory Steer. They bought the rights from Baylis and then received a UK government grant to help develop the product further, including the possibility of adding solar panels. And now the action moves to South Africa where the details of the invention were featured in a new broadcast and heard by someone called Hilton Applebaum, who was head of an organisation called the Liberty Life Foundation. Even in a relatively rich South Africa, half the homes have no electricity, and elsewhere in Africa the problem's even more severe, so he began to see some potential. Liberty Life is a body which was set up by a major South African insurance company and in partnership with Anita and Gordon Roddick, who were the socially conscious owners and founders of The Body Shop. And part of the work of the foundation is providing access to employment for the disabled, and a third of their company's workers are blind, deaf, in wheelchairs or mentally ill. Through Applebaum, Liberty Life provided one and a half million dollars in US dollars in venture capital to help found the company Beigen Power Industries. That name comes from the Bayliss Generator. And this was originally set up by Staines and Steer in 1995 in Cape Town. 60% of the shares were held by a group of organizations for the disabled, which was one condition of Liberty Life's support. Technical development was provided by the Bristol University in the UK Electronics Energy Engineering Department. And shortly after, production of the radio began in earnest in Cape Town by Beigen Products of South Africa. It came on the market at the beginning of 1996, and one year later, around 160,000 units had been sold. Now, much of this early production was purchased by aid charities, working in places like Rwanda and other African countries where relief efforts were underway. It's important to stress this wasn't a glamorous product. A New York Times article described it in the following terms. It's no threat to a Sony Walkman, 
It weighs six pounds, it's built like an overstuffed lunchbox, and it has a tinny speaker. But its wholesale price is only 40 US dollars, and it gets AM, FM, and shortwave, meaning it can pick up the British Broadcasting Corporation or the Voice of America. So a circle of mud huts can zip back into the information age with a twist of the wrist. The impact was significant. In 1996, another BBC television programme, QED, featured the radio, and at one point showed footage of Bayliss, Staines and Steer, together with Nelson Mandela, who commented that this was a fantastic product that can provide an opportunity for those people who've been despised by society. And actually, although it appears basic and low-tech, there's a surprising amount of invention in the product. Bayliss filed no less than 13 patents covering the mainspring and the gears that drive a little dynamo. And that spring mechanism is not a simple clockwork, but much more closely related to the kind used in rewinding auto seat belts. A double spool mechanism keeps its tension constant, which is very crucial, and the gearing is very sophisticated. Now, Beigen continued to develop products around the energy needs of developing countries, including wind-up torches and other kinds of small generator. And the company renamed itself in 1999 as the Free Play Energy Group to take the concepts into a wide range of new product areas. Although it was founded on strong social entrepreneurship principles, the business grew through expanding markets in both developing and advanced economies. And at an early stage in their life, they realised that their dependence on government, international and charitable aid providers posed problems in terms of business sustainability. So in 1997, after investment by the US General Electric Company, they began diversifying into commercial markets, modifying the product designs to suit this shift. But one of the casualties in this growing up phase was the Cape Town factory. After five years of manufacturing, the whole process was outsourced to plants in China where labour costs were lower. The business became commercially successful, selling over 3 million units of the basic radio models and raising an additional 45 million US dollars in venture capital. Product development changed, embracing a wider range of power options, including solar cells, and moving to an increasing range of applications, including torches, lighting, small-scale generators, and mobile phone chargers. Emphasis remained on replacing battery and fixed-line power applications with rechargeable or self-generating approaches, an approach which, given increasing concerns about sustainability in advanced economies, opens up new possibilities for market growth. A typical example of their product range was the Lifeline Radio, a multi-band, self-powered radio, the grandchild, if you like, of the original wind-up model. The Lifeline Radio, according to the company's website, was designed specifically for providing dependable access to information across a broad range of humanitarian projects. The radio does not require batteries or mains electricity and can be used practically anywhere. Engineered to operate in the harshest of rural conditions, it's rugged, robust and easy to operate. It offers excellent FM, AM and shortwave reception and runs on wind-up energy and solar power. Fully charged, it can play for up to 24 hours. The radio was field tested in various developing countries as part of an extensive R&D program to identify and create a radio that truly meets the requirements of these unique and diverse applications. Given the shift to looking at more extensive product opportunities in the energy as well as the communication field, and following some internal concerns, the company changed its name again in 2010 to Lifeline Energy and their mission statement to develop a range of practical, fit-for-purpose products using innovative and appropriate technologies and distribution approaches that the poor can apply to their daily lives. And this reminds us of some of the early concerns Trevor Bayliss had. For example, fewer than 5% of the 500 million people who live in rural sub-Saharan Africa have access to any form of electricity. As part of their product development, they came, for example, with ideas for lighting systems. For example, the Life Light, a simple LED light source which replaces many of the very dangerous high fire risk options which are currently used. Things like candles and oil lamps, which are responsible for many, many problems in developing countries. Quotation, 
It's tragic that in 2010, well over a hundred years after the invention of the light bulb, millions of people in the developing world are still in the dark at night. Now in any entrepreneurial venture, one of the challenges in capturing value is how you scale and sustain what you start. And that's particularly true for social innovations of this kind. As the company commented, researching and assessing what the extremely poor want and need, creating fit for purpose products that people can afford, and then ensuring their distribution through various channels, including the ability for women to earn income and create jobs by selling or renting lights and providing charging services to those without electricity. So a key part of their business model was trying to make sure that these weren't just product innovations, but could actually change the social system for the better. And again, like any entrepreneurial venture, things don't stand still. The company moves on and is involved in extensive business model innovation. They're still very dependent on aid and other income sources, for example. So they're trying to move the business to a more commercial basis in parallel. And that means exploiting potential for what's called reverse technology transfer, selling things like battery chargers and simple LED devices into the developed country markets. 